Chapter 31. Life Interrupted. We all go through periods of darkness. In such times, we can turn to the goddesses, but it's good to have friends. Memory. All the thoughts we have, all the decisions we make, are rooted in layers upon layers of experience. To understand ourselves, we must look to our own past, to our memories. I believe that our pasts and our hearts make us who we are. Our memories define us. But what if we should lose them? Would we become untethered? Adrift? Would we even be the same ponies anymore? If you could block out your most horrible and hurtful memories, would you do so to spare yourself the pain? And if you did, would you lose an important part of yourself in the process? And what of higher thought, reasoning, and rationality? If I were to forget the discoveries that led to a realization, would I be able to grasp that revelation anymore? Could I piece together the logic of an argument that I could not remember having the argument? How important are memories to our ability to think, or at least think clearly? Now what about the reverse? What if you add memories which were not your own? How often could you live parts of other ponies' lives, making their decisions, seeing the events that brought them joy or sorrow, before the boundaries that separated you from them begin to blur? Were memory orbs nothing more evocative than particularly well-written books? I knew from experience that a memory orb only preserved sensations one inside a memory orb, I saw and heard and felt, tasted and smelled, but I did not privy to the actual thoughts and emotions of the host whom I rode. Did the visions into their lives, no matter how vivid, have any impact beyond knowledge and entertainment? And what effect might there be on a pony who relieved or relived the same memory orb over and over? And what if you could take that a step further? What if you could hear a pony's thoughts, read their minds, perhaps sense their memories? What if you were the goddess? What manner of pony would you have to be just to keep any sense of yourself? I stared in horror at the mob of hellhounds pouring into the streets. They came from alleys and the shattered ruins. They climbed out of windows and emerged from darkening doorways in nearly every building I could see. Every one that was except for the one place we intended to go, the hospital. The first had already reached the Maripony Mining and Administration Building. Some were dashing inside. Others sunk their claws into the brick facade and began to scale the walls. Clemity turned to the enclave crates, shoving the claw-torn containers away until he reached a single, undamaged one. I could hear him whisper what sounded like a prayer, although I knew no higher being that Calamity would pray to. Then, he furiously clopped at the locks, cloud, keypad. The crate opened with a hiss, and a wash of cool air. Inside was... a bundle of fluffy white clouds. I would have faced Hoof if the noise Calamity had made at the sight of them hadn't been one of triumph. The Pegasus lowered his head, and kicked off his helmet. His orange mane burst free. His wide eyes and self-pleasing smile gave me a boost of joy. He stayed hidden behind the back, or the black insectoid mask, too long, and I had missed him. How did you know the combination? Zenith asked curiously. Oh, one, oh, four. Harboring his birthday. Clemity grinned proudly, then sheepishly admitted, <clears throat> "'Twas on the terminal. A cloud? A yip? Y'all are in this mess because of me. I plan to get y'all out of it. He leaned his head into the enclave crate, grabbing the cloud bridle in his teeth. He bit the clouds and picked them up. The little pony in my head was having an aneurysm. Oh, roof, he bolstered through the cloud in his mouth. He trotted to the roof's edge, facing the hospital. A hellhound clawed her way up to the roof in front of him, raising a paw full of long, flesh and armor tearing claws. Calamity backed away, dropping the cloud bundle which simply floated where he let it go. Blam! Velvet Remedy's shotgun went off, and the slug hit the hellhound in the center of her left breast. The flesh ripped, but it did not give. The hellhound howled in pain, toppling backwards from the impact. 
Thanks, Celestia, whispered Velvet Remedy, letting out a sigh of relief. I winced as I realized she was thinking, or thanking the goddess, that the Hellhound had thick enough hides to stop a shotgun slug at close range. Until now, I'd only used Little Macintosh and the sniper rifle against them. I'd been lucky in those choices. Nothing else I had would likely penetrate. Another Hellhound clawed his way to the top of the rooftop, directly behind Zenith. The zebra danced, giving a well-placed buck to the creature's chest. I heard ribs break, and the Hellhound fell, rasping, fighting for breath from what I knew was a punctured lung. And a second buck sent the Hellhound over the edge, catching another climber in the face and knocking them both down into the alley below. One of them hit an open waste bin with a, black, a back-breaking clang. I didn't know which had become scarier, Hellhounds or Zenith, who could take them on with their hooves. Thank you kindly, Velvet. Clamity stepped back up to the floating bundle and gave it a kick. The clouds unfurled, rolling outward like a carpet, stretching over the street below. Three more Hellhounds pulled themselves under the rooftop. Velvet Remedy backed up and let out a song, hitting that perfect high-pitched note. All three Hellhounds clutched their ears. Two stopped, backing up to the ledge of the wall, and one climbed back over the side while the other <clears throat> backed up a step too far, her arms pivoting comically as she fell backwards off the roof. The third launched forward, striking a Velvet Remedy in a half-blind swipe. Velvet jumped away, her right foreleg did not, falling to the rooftop in a spreading pink bundle of blood. Velvet's note ended in a strangling whimper as she lifted her right foreleg, eyes locked on where the stump ended inches above where her right knee should have been. The hellhound drew back her paw, one claw wet with Velvet Remy's blood. Four bolts of magical energy struck her in the offending paw, and the female hellhound growled and liquefied. Velvet! I heard a scream of horror. Clemity dashed to the charcoal-coated mare's side, catching her as she wobbled and fell, her eyes still locked on where her right foreleg should be. I can fix this, she whimpered. Velvet fainted on Clemity's forelegs. Pyrolite pierced the air with a mournful cry. No. Zenith moved fast, pulling potions from her satchel until she found the right one. She shattered it on the rooftop, commanding our pegasus. Push her wound into that. Quickly. It looked like the same pudding that Zenith had given Velvet to stop Calamity's wing from bleeding him dry. Wrapping Velvet's sundering leg in my magic, I floated it to the puddle and pressed into the gloop as well. We can fix this, I moaned with determination. She can fix this. She said so. I could hear more hellhounds tearing their way through the roof from inside and out. Calamity held Velvet, looking stunned. His eyes glistening, his armor was slick with Velvet's blood. Clemity, now! Zenith shouted into her, his ears, breaking the pegasus from his trance. He shoved the bleeding stump into Zenith's medical goop, hard enough to make the unconscious Velvet moan. Turning to me, Clemity commanded, Zenith, put little Pip on my back. Little Pip, levitate every pony but me and yourself. And don't forget Velvet's leg. He let Velvet Remedy slide out of his arms and galloped to the cloud carpet, stepping onto it. The cloud held him like it was made of the surest steel. I felt a harsh tug at my mane as Zenith lifted me onto Calamity's back. I winced, but the tears blurred my vision were for Velvet. I floated up her limp, maimed body into the air, wrapping her severed limb in magic as well, and finally, Zenith. Two hellhounds burst up through the roof hatch. A third dug her way through the ceiling itself, one of the torn enclave crates knocking her in the throat as she slid from the hole. Let them chase us across this, Clemity broke into a gallop, carrying me over the streets on a bed of clouds, my mare friends swooping across the urban canyon, towed by my magic. The two hellhounds from the hatch dropped on all fours and ran for us, leaping for Clemity and me. They would have landed right behind us, but they fell through the clouds, as was proper for creatures and clouds, and dashed themselves on the street below. 
One got up, dusting himself off, then took one look at the building we were heading onto, and turned the other way. The second had broken her neck, and never got up. I figure y'all got till that beacon shuts up to scavenge what we came from the hospital, Clemity barked, turning to look back over the walkway of clouds. The hellhounds continued to swarm the Maripony Mining and Administration Building, heedless of our escape. I'll stay here and get this thing wriggled up. And I will stay here, Velvet breathed weakly, and protect Calamity. Y'all gonna protect me? Calamity gave her a politely disbelieving look. She smiled back with a glare of her own. If my voice cannot soothe the savage beasts, it can, at least, send them running. <clears throat> I hated this plan. Words could not describe how much I hated this plan. The only thing making me agree to this plan was a severe lack of time and the inability to see any better way. And the spark of hope born from that one hellhound's reaction. A hope that, maybe, the hellhounds had an aversion to the hospital that would protect us. Turning to Zenith, I motioned her to follow. We had no time to lose, and now we had two major injuries that demanded our top medical supplies. I prayed to Luna that this place had not been stripped clean already, that somehow, for any reason, this hospital was still well stocked. Ah, crap, Calamity said, still staring across the cloud bridge. I turned an alarm, my stomach dropping. Oh, goddesses, please, not anything else, please. I left my helmet. I wanted to buck him so hard. Leave it. You look better without it anyway. A thought struck me. Can you still shoot those rifles without the helmet's interface? Nope. Well, that sinking feeling was reinforced. How many shots do you have left for Spitfire's Thunder? I'll swap to a fresh clip, but I've only got three. Plus, the two shots left in the current one. More than you'd have time to fire if he was shooting alone. I looked to Velvet Memory at Mitty bleakly. Go on, Pip. I'll take care of him, Velvet insisted. Pyrolite landed next to her, puffing out her chest and looking fierce. I nodded before looking back to Calamity, and then to the candy-colored heap that was the Griffin Chaser 2. Can you fix her? Yep, positive. Now go. Pyrolite gave me a heartbreaking look. Zenith was waiting for me at the rooftop access doors. I nodded one last time, praying to the goddesses that this was not the last time I would see them alive, then galloped gently away. Zenith and I made our way through the crumbling gray halls with peeling yellow uh, wainscoting. Motes of dust flew through the air, occasional debris raining down from the ceiling. I took the lead, moving quickly and stealthily, checking rooms. My EFS insisted that there were numerous enemies inside the hospital, lurking somewhere ahead and behind us. From my experience in Stable 24, I suspected they were all on the level below. It hit me as an unfair that even with the signal, there would still be hellhounds inside this place hunting us. But as I prepared to curse the heavens, wondering if perhaps I should be cursing the stars, I remembered Calamity and the bloat sprite in the closet. The curse died with a chuckle as I realized we were probably surrounded by hostile insects, bloat spites, or rad roaches, or whatever rad roaches became when in the presence of the taint. As I turned down a hallway, my ears perked up at the sound of a blessedly familiar male voice. Who says you can't go home again? That tenacious mare from Stable 2 sure did. And saved her whole damn home from a vicious and unprovoked attack from Steel Rangers, who intended to slaughter the stable's entire population and set up shop. But this time, children, the stable dweller had help. That's right, our bringer of light in this dark and cruel world has stirred the hearts of other ponies. And not just ponies, but griffins too. Even ghouls put a hoof into the cause. I'll tell you, children, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in the Equestrian Wasteland. The people, ponies, 
and non-ponies alike, have witnessed our heroine selflessly helping those around her, and many of us have taken to her example. And when our wasteland saver needed us the most, we stepped up. Now I ask each and every one of you, and this is a question straight from DJ Pwn 3's heart to yours. When the opportunity comes, will you step up too? I felt myself flush, but this time, the embarrassment was buried under a heartburst of love for the gray unicorn behind that voice. Her words were like a beam from a lighthouse in my storm of darkness. Let me tell you of some of the ponies who did step up, because you are not going to believe this. The Steel Rangers, a saddle full of them at any rate, decided to buck their elders and pledge themselves to helping out the suffering folk of this equestrian wasteland. You heard me right, children. Some of those metal-clad powerhouses are on our side now. That ain't easy, and their elders have ordered them hunted down. I have reports of Steel Rangers and Steel Ranger outcasts fighting in the streets of Manhattan to Trottingham. But I've also got amazing reports that these outcasts taken down raider hovels and gallop into the aid of caravans. So you should happen to see one of these new outcast knights or paladins. Give me your thanks and maybe a little ammo. I felt both thankful and hurt as I thought of Steelhooves and those who now followed him, embattled in the streets, fighting for their lives because they chose not to follow ponies who were selfish and evil. The pony in my head wondered what would happen if the Pegasi ever learned the truth about this word below them. Would they seek to help, or only to have their leaders turn upon them? I moved forward, following the voice, Nudging the door open to the office where an old radio sat, dusty and neglected. The face above the dial still glowing as the speakers gave DJ Pwn 3's voice, a slightly tinny echo. One last thing, and this is to the stable dweller herself, another message from my assistant. But don't worry, children, I read it this time, and it's perfectly chaste. I froze, my mind conjuring everything from another devastatingly embarrassing, embarrassing promise to another warning, as soul-breaking as the warning from Stable 2. She says, Wherever you are right now, I'm thinking of you. Look up at the darkness of the night sky, and know that I am looking up at the same darkness with you. We are never apart, no matter how far you drive, to help us. All takes you from this place. For you are in my heart, always. I love you, little Pip. I felt my heart gush bursting with joy. Ah, now ain't that just romantic? Don't that just tug at your heartstrings? When did my assistant get so cheesy? Oh, and there's a PS. 31, huh? What's 31 mean? Mine simply went blank. I was drowning in embarrassment, burning alive from the heat that suddenly flashed through my body. Oh dear, Zenith intoned behind me her exotic voice holding not a trace of actual sympathy. She leaned forward and whispered into my ear. I should tell Velvet Remedy so she does not hear it first from strangers, no? I collapsed, dying of sheer humiliation. How much had banished me to a world of embarrassment? And Zenith had imprisoned me in a dungeon of anticipated torment in that world I had been banished to. It wasn't until hours later that I realized Zenith's words carried with them the implicit hope that Velvet Remedy would survive. By making me certain Velvet would soon be teasing me endlessly, Zenith dispelled my fear that I was about to lose her. The medical cabinet opened with ease, the lock hardly a worthy challenge. Zenith began to collect the medicines and healing bandages inside. So far, the hospital had been the treasure trove of lesser supplies, but had not yielded any more potent potions we were desperately searching for. I looked across the room filled with rotten beds, tattered partitions, and toppled ivy stands. A night wind blew through the broken windows, making the curtains dance like ghosts. The foul scent of a hundred hellhounds drifted through the room. I glanced outside and saw them crawling all over the building across from us like a swarm of bees. I wondered why they didn't just destroy the array, but maybe they couldn't. Maybe there was something in the pulse that didn't allow them to. Still, 
with that many trying to climb onto the roof. It was only a matter of time before they destroyed it, just by accident. I looked the other way, out the door. There was a nurse's station across the hall. No red lights on my EFS. I let Zenith know where I was headed, and slipped out, pressing an ear to the door. I thought I heard a snake-like hiss. I checked my EFS again, but there were no threats. The door was locked. Again, hardly a challenge. But when I tried to push the door open, it didn't want to budge. I shoved, throwing my weight against it, and I heard a crash from inside the door as it opened half a yard away. Dust and old past plaster blasted out from the opening. A fast clicking burst from my pit buck. I poked my head through, coughing, and saw the ceiling had collapsed, filling most of the room. Broken terminals and office supplies littered the floor around large husks of structural material. I could see partially into the room above, where a bathtub teetered, hanging from the washroom above by only the plumbing. Water sprayed out of a crack in the pipes, soaking the rubble from the floor below and draining down into the level beneath us through a section of the nurse's station floor, which had given way from decades of water damage. There wasn't too much inside the room, but I saw I could reach a locked metal cabinet with the word confiscated, written in large red letters. I removed my saddlebags and squeezed through the opening. The metal cabinet proved a tougher lock. With my skills, I could still do it, but it was still a worthy challenge. Enough that I felt a touch of pride as it opened. Inside were drugs, buck, dash, mintals, and a variety of powerful painkillers, as well as other pills and powders, which I did not recognize. There were other things too. A memory orb, a knife with a blade that shimmered with an unnatural purple sheen, a copy of Zebra Infiltration Tactics. I floated my saddlebags to me, and with a telekinetic push, I dumped the entire contents into one of them. A tin of party time mintals landed on the top. My heart skipped a beat. I wrapped the tin with a, magical, with a magical sheath. Do we really have time for this? The little pony in my head asked. Hurry, we can dump it later. I knew she was lying. I knew I needed to get rid of it now. And if I carried it around with me, the temptation to take one when things got bad might be more than I could bear. Oh, come on. You're stronger than that, the pony insisted. And I was. Wasn't I? Or... What if Zenith could use it for a potion or something? That would be a shame to waste. Damn it. I was taking too much time. I closed the saddlebags, floating them out ahead of me. I slithered out to the nurse's station. I had been so distracted from my inner struggle that I didn't even notice the red light at the very edge of my EFS compass. There were no goddesses. There couldn't be, for I was seeing, to be allowed to exist. The... Fang that shuffled down the hall before me had clearly once been meant to be a pony. There was enough pony left in his face to tell that horrifying truth. There was nobody to describe the vile, sickening body of the thing. The best my brain could manage was the idea that a pony had started to melt, losing all her fur and keeping only sporific tufts of her mane and tail, only for the flesh beneath to stop melting. Arbitrarily, and not all at once, and then begin to bloat and metastasize. Its eyes sunken and huge and red stared into mine. Its tongue had swollen and stretched, bursting out of its muzzle and spilling onto tendrils as they hung down from the wreckage that had once been its mouth. The tentacles writhed individually as if in great pain. I was petrified by the sight, rooted to the floor with no ability or will to move. I wanted to run screaming as that split tongue undulged yeah, and whipped out, stretching the length of the hall, wrapping each, each wrapping wetly around one of my hooves. I felt, I felt dragged forward towards the squirming flesh blob my gaze locked into its eyes. I tried to scream, but somehow it had stolen my voice. 
The tongues lifted me over a mass of writhing, furless tissue, as another tongue-like tentacle pushed out of its muzzle. The tentacles twisted me over. My eyes turned to the ceiling, but my paralysis broke. I thrashed, letting out a scream of horror. The tongues were impossibly strong. I could not pull my hooves free, and I continued to rotate until I faced away from it, the hallway beneath me upside down. I witnessed Zenith dash out of the room to save me, then stop, eyes wide and locked in place. I felt that new tongues slowly across me, and I realized with abject terror that the flesh bob did not intend to kill me. No. I screamed in a mix of fury and primal panic. No, 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 bam! No, 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 bam! No, 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 bam! My screams were punctuated by the fury of Little Macintosh as I made my weapon fire blindly into the mass of living flesh. I was hit by a cloaking reek and felt the tongues go slack, dropping me. I hit the creature. Its body felt like a warm and slimy beanbag chair with grotesque muscle and sinew hidden beneath and bounced onto the floor. I scrambled away. I felt sickened, loathing my body where I had touched. Oh, little Pip, I'm so sorry, Zenith cried out, galloping up to me. I got shakily to my hooves. Little Macintosh's bullets had torn gaping holes in the flesh of the thing. What, what, what is th that? I do not know, Zenith said fearfully, but we must be more cautious. There may be more of them, and they possess a stare. We had moved through the rows of the hospital pharmacy. Our hooves left tracks through the spilled powders that covered the floor. Many of the stacks had partially collapsed, spilling their contents onto the tiles below. I waved the lamp of my pit buck over the barely legible labels on a shelf, which held little jars of unsullied medical treasures. Zena trotted up, a sack held in her teeth which she had found in the housekeeping section behind us. She scooped a seemingly random choice of the tiny jars into the sack with a hoof. I didn't know if any of those would help either Calamity or Velvet Remedy, but I learned to trust the value of Xena's alchemy and brewing. We both froze at the sick, shuffling sound of another of the flesh bobs. Dropping the sack, Xena moved towards the pharmacy counter as I moved to the pharmacy door. Zenith pushed herself up, peering over the counter cautiously, and didn't move. Every muscle in her body was locked in place. I could hear the softest sound strangling from her throat as the slick tongues in the thing in the room beyond distended and stretched into start wrapping around her. I darted out of the pharmacy and around the corner, getting the barest glimpse of the creature before squeezing my eyes furiously shut and firing several bursts from my zebra rifle into where the creature had just been. I heard an unearthly squeal, and was assaulted by the hatred stench of the thing's blobuous flesh burning away. I opened my eyes to see Zenith rushing herself free from the limp appendages as the fire climbed up them towards her. She barely avoided being burned. Sorry, I said with a grimace, as we both coughed and gagged mentally noting that the zebra rifle was no longer to be used against these. Or for that matter, any tainted creatures, considering my run of luck, when pairing the two. Zina tied off her bag, and I helped tie it across from her satchel. Together, we moved to the nearby stairwell, not taking time to peek in the garbage bins. This was already taking far longer than I was comfortable with and that discomfort didn't even include the creepy itching that was starting to spread inside me. According to the old paint, the next floor down was the emergency care and operating rooms. They were our best bet for extra strength restoration potions. We had to sneak up on them from behind, we quickly learned. To look the slithering flesh mounds in the face was to be paralyzed, mind and body. We did not know if these things could affect more than one mare at one time, but neither Zenith nor I were foolish enough to risk it. They were, however, the opposite of hellhounds in many ways. They were slow, stupid monstrosities, possessing no tactical skill, driven only by the basest of urges. 
and their flesh was weak. Even a low-caliber bullet would cause great uh, sinking ruptures in their tuberous bodies. We made it to the surgical level. Benches lined the walls that had once been a small waiting room. Rotted periodicals stained the floor. There were a few pony skeletons in here, two with cracked pelvic bones. An ill shudder racked me as it occurred to me that the pony mares had not been killed by the horror which had invaded them, but the horror that had come out. Beyond the waiting room was a hallway which ended in a swinging pair of double doors. Midway down the hallway were two heavy vault-like doors, each with a wall-mounted terminal. One of these was the medical supply room for the floor. The sign above the other one simply stated, Isolation. The one bright point was that the hospital seemed entirely unscavenged. There was no sign of hellhound claws. There was no mystery anymore why they shunned the place. Oh dear, oh dear, came a slightly tinny voice from the other side of the swinging operating room doors. My EFS was picking up two entries, one of which was a non-hostile presence, the other glowing red on the compass. Mrs. Tulip, I'm afraid you've come down with a serious case of death. I'm afraid this is beyond my meager skills, but I do recommend plenty of bed rest, and I will alert the next available doctor to your condition. The two of us crept down the hall, stopping at the terminals. The one to the medical supply room was dead, leaving me to pick the lock telekinetically. Good afternoon, Mr. Tester, said the oddly cheery voice. I am pleased to see some of your color has returned. Let me change your IV tubes for you. No, no, don't fuss. You only make this harder. The straps are for your own good. The tumblers moved, sliding reluctantly into place, and the medical room opened up. I put in my pit buck lamp into the dark space, hopping feveredly for a spot of luck. Inside were racks of collapsed shelving. A metal cabinet had pulled free from the wall and fallen, catching on a counter edge. The door swung open, its contents spilling and shattering on the floor. Xena took a guarding position as I stepped inside. Moving like prey, with any luck, we would be in and out before either of the entities in the room noticed our passing. There was one cabinet that looked fairly intact, but from the stains around the bottom of the door, the insides had not fared so well as the exterior. My heart sank into my stomach and started to die. Outside, the chipper voice said, Miss Sunshower, dear, let me put that back on for you. You'll never hear a heel if you keep losing your head like that. My hooves really felt really terribly heavy as I approached the cabinet. It was locked, and the lock was a tricky one. It took a few tries to open, but that was due in part to the numb dread that was creeping through me. Really? Is the cleaning staff completely lazy? Just look at the state of this room. Hardly sanitary. If a minister of peace inspector were to show up, some point would be out of a job. I wanted to gallop out, find the source of the voice, and buck it to death. Instead, I opened the door. Jackpot. Zenith was carefully putting each of the healing poultices and extra strength restoration potions we had found in my saddlebags. We had found less than I had hoped for, but hopefully more than enough. In addition, there was a smaller lockbox, which had proven far trickier to open. Inside was an advanced medical spell matrix. I floated the Arcano Tech Drive, a peripheralia with identically enhanced gemstones in the center, out of his box and carried it with me. I'll be right back, I told Zenith, scanning my EFS, once again to make sure no other hostiles were in the area. Zenith kept watch, ready to pull me back as I crept towards the operating room doors. I moved as stealthily as possible, little Macintosh floating close to me. If the red lights on my EFS were another of those horrors, I didn't want to have the time to turn my way. I hoped it wasn't already facing the door. I nudged open the door and looked around. The operating room was full of gurneys, most of which bore the skeleton of a pony. A few were empty and one held a bloated, fleshy body in one of the horrors. It was strapped down with an ivy needle jabbed into it. 
The IV tube was less than a yard long and dangled off the creature's blubose mass. The others, the other end attached to nothing. A bright yellow multi-limbed medical bot hovered from gurney to gurney, helping its patients. The blob of flesh wiggled. I unloaded four shots into it. Little Macintosh echoing through the floor. The horse seemed to deflate, filling the air with an awful fetid stench like bile and sewage. I had to turn away, covering my muzzle with my hoof, my eyes watering. I galloped back in the hall, stopping in the waiting room and vomiting violently. The acidic taste of bile in my mouth was actually preferable to the smell of the horror's innards. I swallowed and wet my muzzle, feeling faint. I turned back, trotting to the door again, embracing myself for the suffocating reek. I pushed in, holding my breath as long as I could, and snuck towards the malfunctioning medical bot. I could reprogram it, I believed, routing around the corrupted sectors of his programming. And with the advanced medical spell matrix, it would not only have the medical expertise to help, but would be able to utilize a small number of medical spells. Perhaps even ones that Velvet Remedy could learn from. In the very least, it would be an asset to Junction R7. At best, it could keep Velvet Remedy reattached, or help Velvet Remedy reattach her severed foreleg. But all that was for later, the trip back. Right now, I just needed to shut it off. I walked out of the operating room, my robotic prize wrapped in a magical field and floating next to me. I stopped as I met up with Zenith, and I stared at the vault door behind or beneath the darkened sign reading Isolation. The terminal next to the sealed door was glowing softly, and the little pony in my head pranced with eager curiosity. It would only take a minute. I hooked my hacking tool in and went to work. The door clanged internally and slid open. Inside was a small room with filing cabinets, a desk, a glowing terminal, and a huge reinforced window that looked into slightly larger chambers. The chamber had a single operating table positioned below a ceiling mounted robotic medical array. The spider-like mass of arms holding scalpels, bone saws, and torturous looking medical tools protruded down towards the form still strapped to the table. It was one of the flesh horrors, only this one was dead already. Its flesh patrucent, and its tongues had been severed, its body sliced open and partially dissected. There was one other difference. Stretched and distorted from the rear of its mutated flesh was the deformed remnants of a cutie mark. I heard some pony gasp in horror. I think it was me. The observation room had been virtually untouched for centuries. The quake of the mega spell had cracked the window, but it had held. The paint on the walls was peeling, and the ceiling sagged a little, covering, a, uh, covering in spider-like cracks. The room beyond, however, was missing a corner, the ragged edges suggesting massive water damage. I wondered if it was caused by the spill in the pipes above the nurse's station, but there was similar damage in many parts of the building. I approached the room's terminal and hacked it. There was one audio still remaining. The others had been corrupted or purged. I asked it to play, and a mayor's voice, a ghost from the past, came overhead from the speakers. This is Sunny Day's Mariponi consultant to the Ministry of Arcane Science. It is now two days since the accident had ended Peachy Pie's life as we know it. Eighteen hours since I had to order the brainstem of this thing severed. Previous attempts to put Peachy Pie's life, or to put the creature down through lethal injection, proved futile. Even now, we are still reading life signs. The thing just does not want to die. But there's no brain function anymore, and hopefully the rest of the body will get the hint. I've ordered the autopsy halted until then. I take comfort in knowing that my childhood friend died two days ago, and that there was nothing left of her in this abomination. I finally managed to get an audience with the Ministry Mayor, Twilight Sparkle. I have learned that the Ar Ministry of Arcane Science is using my old facility to create something called Impelled 
Metamorphosis Potion. According to Twilight Sparkle, this IMP will likely become the deciding factor in the war. It is clearly our hope that through medical augmentation, we can bring the war to a swift conclusion. The zebras have been engaging in mystical and alchemical augmentations for years now, and it sounds to me like the Ministry of Arcane Science is determined to beat them at their own game. I questioned Ministry Mayor Twilight Sparkle about the contents of the barrels now being stored in the caravans, or the caverns, underneath Splendid Valley. She revealed that these barrels contained effectively the very same transformative magical brew that the Arcane Science Ministry is testing for use on pony volunteers. According to the Ministry Mayor, the process for creating IMP is extremely delicate and demanding, and apparently her standards are even more so. Any batch that is flawed in any way, any batch that is not absolutely optimal, is sealed up and discarded. In Twilight Sparkle's own words, if she is going to ask ponies to trust their bodies to IMP-induced transformation, how could she dare give them anything but the most perfect versions of the potion possible? The Ministry Mayor is absolutely horrified to hear of the accident, and appalled as it told her what had happened to Peachy Pie. She put a strict moratorium on any further attempts to move the barrels. It looks like Ministry Mayor Fluttershy is going to have to find a different avenue of negotiation with the Diamond Dogs. Personally, at this point, I'm tempted to just start shooting them. I know that's horrible of me, but I've spent two days seeing the best friend I've ever known reduced to something worse than any nightmare. And all because we're trying to appease a bunch of dogs. The worst part is that part of me blames Peachy Pie. She shouldn't have been down there. She'd come to work sick the last four mornings. I told her to take sick leave. Practically ordered her to. But she could never stand to be doing nothing. Part of me wonders if she slipped, or if her judgment was slightly impaired. And I hate myself for asking that. She deserves better. Peachy Pie was the best friend any pony could ever have. Her husband is outside. He wants to see the body. I have no idea what to tell him. All I know is that I can't. Absolutely can't. Let him see it. I stumbled out of the isolation room and collapsed against the wall, breathing heavily. Little Pip? Zenith asked, her voice deep with concern. She had heard Sunny Day's recording too. I could see the sadness in her eyes and hear in her voice. But she didn't know what I knew, didn't realize what I did. She could tell the recording was affecting me far more than it did her even though she could not sense the re revelation behind it. Taint, on the other hoof, Hamid had said as DJ Pon3, is a zebra of very different stripes. No pony knows exactly what the taint is, or where it comes from, but we know its mutative effects on monsters and the fatally malnegavant repercussions on ponies. I knew what taint was. I knew where it came from. I know that as you travel, as you poke your nose into places and memories, you're going to hear things or learn things about my twi, Spike had once warned me painfully. Taint was IMP, Impelled Metamorphosis Potion. This was Twilight Sparkle's other legacy. But that wasn't being fair. Twilight Sparkle had been a good pony with a good heart. Of course the MAS hub in Manhattan had been working on a spell to clean taint, and it was no longer a surprise that they did or that they had been successful when every pony since that insane doctor, Ghoul, had failed. Twilight Sparkle knew exactly what the taint was, after all. She knew every component that went into it, and after what happened to Peachy Pie, she was not going to let, going to be content to just leave that kind of dangerous magical toxin in barrels underground. She was working to clean it up. Of course, the Gardens of Equestria would include a spell to purge taint from the land. I suspected that Twilight Sparkle would have created a taint purging mega spell and set it off over Splendid Valley just as soon as the pony testing of IMP had proven successful. The only variable was, well, 
dosage. Twilight Sparkle's words floated back to me. The IMP experiment at Mariponi required a very tightly controlled dosage. Who knew the effects of too little would be? A deep itch that had now spread through my entire torso told me that I would likely learn soon. But that was when they discovered that Twilight's magical byproducts, shall we say, have started eating through the barrels, Rory had told Rainbow Dash. Sunny lost a pony, trying to move them, when several tore open like they were made of nothing but covering paint. The horror on the other side of that window was what becoming what was becoming of any pony who suffered massive exposure. If that creature had been created from a few barrels, I was thankful that I'd never seen Trixie herself inside that vat. And if you just and if you got it just right, that was how Trixie was creating the alicorns. I wondered how long it had taken her to find the correct amount, and how many failed experiments had she cannibalized before she stuck to the perfect dose. My eyes went to the hole in the corner of the far chamber. Peachy Pie had been getting sick each morning for days. The medical equipment was still picking up anomaly life signs after the creature should have been dead. I knew where the other horrors had come from. Zenith and I galloped all the way back to the top of the roof. I slammed through the door, stumbling and panting. We've got what we came for. Velvet Remedy was looking decidedly bad, but thank the goddesses that she was still conscious. Clemity stood at the edge of the building, looking down. I noticed his helmet in his mouth. He had run across and gotten it. That meant... I looked at the building across from us. All the hellhounds were gone. The antenna array was smashed to pieces, except for the edge, casting a glance, or at the griffin chaser, too. It still looked like a mess, but I could see the work Calamity had done. Calamity set down his helmet. In case y'all missed it, they're telling us to surrender. Looking down, I saw hellhounds surrounding the building, some carrying energy weapons, a few dozen carrying torches. Most were armed with only their claws. Standing on a dilapidated wagon was one particularly large female hellhound, holding a megaphone. You come down now, she barked, her voice carrying. Final chance. And I really hoped we could treat Calamity's wing and Velvet Remedy's leg here, but that was no longer an option. Come on, Calamity. Let's go. Grimly. I don't get why they ain't swarmed us yet. Grimly, I answered. I do. And trust me, you're much happier not knowing. He turned from the ledge and picked up his helmet again and walked towards Velvet Remedy, his eyes looking older than they had the day before. Not your fault, Velvet Remedy insisted to the Pegasus as he laid down next to her. He set down the helmet and nuzzled the charcoal unicorn. Yes, it is. I'm the one who got his wing shot, and I'm the one who wanted to snipe the hellhounds. Y'all faced all this shit. Helping me. And I ain't gonna forget that. Not ever. Suddenly, the whole building shook. A thunderous rendering boiled up from beneath us. A massive fissure tore across the roof of a few yards back from the south side edge. And the entire southern wall of the hospital collapsed with a monstrous roar. The goddess damned hellhounds were taking out the fucking foundation. Out of time, every pony, I shouted as I climbed into the Griffin Chaser and tried to figure out how to operate the Earth Pony contraption. Thankfully, it was rather simper, simple. While the mechanics used a spark battery, augmented assist, the whole thing was basically pedal powered. And Zebra, I added, gather together, we're leaving. More of the building began to collapse. The roof canted, and the Griffin Chaser 2 began to slide towards the ragged edge. I wrapped everyone else in a field of magic, making sure to include the medical bot, Velvet Remedy's leg, Calamity's helmet, and Xena's sacks of medicine. 
I started to pedal as hard as I could. The gears and belts and chains on the Griffin Chaser 2 squealed in protest. The blades began to spin. With a horrendous rumble, the hospital roof fell away beneath us, and the hospital collapsed into billowing clouds of smoke and debris. We didn't fall with it. The clouds of dust puffed up at us. Slowly, getting a feel for the flying contraption, I turned us towards Maripony and the Sky Bandit. After everything that had come before, there was nothing I could do. Zenith was brewing a potion, using her mix of her own supplies and the chemicals we had just gathered. I could smell the odd scents coming from the pot she held over the cook fire. Zenith told us this would augment Velvet Remedy's own healing, allowing her leg to heal fully and properly once it was reattached. It would also permanently alter her, like previous brews had altered me. Somehow, while such enhancement would be viewed as a gift, this felt like a sacrifice. A final step in severing Velvet Remedies from who she was before. After this, she really wouldn't be the same pony anymore. Clementine had refused to leave Velvet Remedy's side the entire time I had spent reprogramming the medical bot. While I was at it, I'll admit I had changed the robot's name. Considering its next operation would be, I didn't feel Sawbones was particularly appropriate. Now it was up to the medical bot and Velvet Remedy to treat her and Calamity. I could only sit back and watch, and I didn't think I could bear to do that. We were, for the moment, safe. The Alicorns were creating a perimeter around Maripony, and the Hellhounds seemed to be taking the rest of the night off. I pulled up my Pipbuck's inventory sorting spell, looking for the memory orb I had found in the hospital. I was shocked to find a tin of Partitan Mintals amongst my supplies. For a moment, I couldn't remember how it had gotten there. I ordered the inventory sorter to bury it at the bottom of the saddlebags. The little pony in my head, once an advocate for keeping them, now nickered at me in disappointment. Stupid, inconsistent little pony. I floated out the orb, laying it on a chunk of rubble in front of me, and quickly captured it again as it started to roll, finding a better place to set it. I focused directly on the orb with my magic. The world melted away. The world smelled of scented lotions and ephemerant fragrances. The floor beneath me was uncomfortable. My flanks lounged into plush carpeting. I felt warmth and weight pressed against me from the mare wrapping, wrapped in my forelegs. Her tears soaked into my coat over my breast. I could hear the pony crying, and behind that, a soft, twinkling music from somewhere up above. In the other room, the familiar mare's voice was saying, I mean, that's wonderful news, right? Why don't you sound happy? The pony in my forelegs had the gentlest yellow coat and a flowing pink mane, and was Fluttershy. But I do deserve it, Fluttershy mumbled against my breast, her body hitching with sobs. I... The legs holding Fluttershy had an elegant white coat that was getting must, and I was Rarity. Rarity felt weak from barely containing sadness, and exhaustion I knew only too well. Her eyes burned at the edge of tears, but she was holding them back, remaining strong for the yellow pegasus in her embrace. Fluttershy wailed meekly. I am a traitor. I don't believe that, I heard my host say gently. Rainbow Dash was... Fluttershy turned her face to me, her eyes overflowing with tears. Rarity. I gave mega spells to the zebras. I felt my host tense, her eyes growing wide. But still, she didn't let Fluttershy go. She held her, her voice shocked, but her tone non-judgmental as she asked, Why would you do that? Fluttershy gave a wretched squeal as she felt Rarity tense. Her expression told me she expected to be rejected, pushed away, maybe worse. But there was a tone of resolve in her voice when she answered. To stop the war. Rarity shook her head. How? You remember the test? I have healing spells that mega spells will let me heal almost anything. Zebras have potions that allow them to regenerate wounds, and a mega spell will make their whole army like that. 
Have you seen Twilight's new shield spell? A mega spell shield that could protect a whole city. Fluttershy looked at her unicorn friend. Fierce determination shining behind those large eyes that were shimmering with tears. If both sides had mega spells, we wouldn't be able to kill each other anymore. They'd have to stop fighting. I felt Rarity shudder, a knot forming in her throat. The tears she had been holding back now began to flow freely. She knew, I could tell, that such was not the way either side was going to use this gift. Oh, Fluttershy. As the first tear raced down her right cheek, Rarity leaned forward, brushing aside the flowing pink mane that obscured most of Fluttershy's face, and planted a kiss on the Pegasus Pony's forehead. You were always the best of us. She hugged the Pegasus tighter. Never, ever, regret what you've done, darling. She held Fluttershy's head against her breast, so the Pegasus could not see her weeping. In the background, I could hear the other voice saying, What? Oh, oh no, my sister's fine. We're... I recognize the voice of Sweetie Belle now. We're at the spa on Leaf Fall Lane. Rarity's been here all afternoon, trying to get Fluttershy to stop crying. Fluttershy shuddered, whimpering. Rarity? I... I can't breathe. Her meek, hesitant tone suggested that she'd accept it if Rarity just kept squeezing her. Rarity quickly let go. Oh, Fluttershy, I'm so sorry. She got up, quickly turning away before the Pegasus could see her tears. I need to, I need to freshen up a bit. Will you be okay until I get back? Fluttershy squeaked but nodded. My host trotted quickly to the little mare's room. On the way, she passed an anxious-looking spa pony. Stopping, Rarity whispered, Remember, you're closed. I'm very sorry, and the Ministry of Image will pay you triple your lost earnings. But we really can't be disturbed right now. Before the spa pony could respond, Rarity nearly galloped the rest of the way, pushing through the door to the ladies' room. As the door swung shut behind her, I could hear Sweetie Belle saying, Fluttershy says Rainbow Dash called her a traitor. Rarity's nerves felt fried. She was shedding tears, and it was making it difficult to see. But the sight of her in the mirror looked sad and terrified. Her horn was glowing, and something floated out of her side purse. She wiped her eyes with a forehoof to better see the framed picture. It was the Ministry Mares, all together, looking much younger, maybe my age. They were looking disheaved, but happy, wearing once elegant dresses that appeared to have been worn through a wrestling match. There was Spike, too, but not Spike as I had known, or imagined him, Baby Spike. They were all gathered around a round table, covered in what looked like donut crumbs. I... I don't think I can take this anymore. I was nothing before you. You're th the best friends a pony could ha have. The best ponies ever. Rarity choked up. And, and it feels like I'm losing all of you. Rarity's whole body shuddered. She looked up at the mirror, and was shocked by what she saw. Turning to the stink sink, she splashed water under her face, and tried to wash away any trace of her sadness. Looking up, she drew herself up tall. Stop feeling sorry for yourself, Rarity. Fluttershy needs you. Her horn glowed again, opening her purse and lifting up the picture. The door pushed open. Rarity turned, a natural-looking smile already forced into her muzzle. Her eyes widened upon seeing Sweetie Belle looking mournful. Sis, I'm sorry to interrupt, but... Yes? Rory said with hopefully cheer... With hopeful cheer, I know she didn't feel. Applejack's been in an accident. I could feel Rarity's body tense. An accident? Is she alright? She's in a coma, but the doctors say she'll recover. At the word coma, Rarity's magic imploded. The framed picture dropped to the floor with a clatter. Apple Bloom says Twilight Sparkle's on her way to see them. She wants to know if you and Fluttershy can come see Applejack too. Rarity swayed, forcing her voice to not waver. 
She informed her little sister. Of course we will. Fluttershy and I will head to Manhattan right now. She gave her sister a smile. And will you be coming too? Sweetiebel nodded. I've already made arrangements. There's a train leaving in an hour. The younger unicorn slipped back out, closing the door behind her. I'll see you there. The moment Rarity was alone again. The usually elegant unicorn swayed on the verge of fainting. As she braced herself against the sink, her eyes fell to the picture on the floor. A slight crack now ran down the glass, separating Pinkie Pie from Fluttershy and Rainbow Dash and Twilight Sparkle. The unicorn mare whimpered softly. Her magic wrapped around the picture and tucked it back into her purse, then drew out a familiar headset. She touched her hoof to the air bloom. Rarity turned the mirror, looking at herself. A look of sad determination crossed her face. A voice cracked in the ear bloom. Hello? Ministry of Image? Mistress Rarity's office? This is Rarity. Contact the Ministry's top magician. Tell him I've changed my mind, and that I'll need his services on that special project, after all. <laughs>